Millions of frontline workers keep our economy running and are provided with the latest technology to do their jobs. But digital adoption, especially by frontline workers, is really hard. This is Frontline Innovators. We explore how to overcome challenges and achieve success when we empower our essential workers. I'm Justin Lake. And I'm Gene Signorini. Together, we speak with experts who are leading the way and driving digital transformation to the front line. This podcast is sponsored by Skillful on a mission to help frontline workers learn and use the technology needed to succeed in their jobs. Welcome to the Frontline Innovators Podcast. I'm your host, Gene Signorini, and I'm excited to be joined by two experts for today's episode. First, let me introduce Jason Jackson, a Lean Six Sigma Greenbelt, who's a certified supply chain professional by the Association of Supply Chain Management. He currently serves as manager and change management North America lead and is a member of the Global Center of Excellence for Change Management at Meebach Consulting. Jason, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me, Eugene. Also joining Jason today is his colleague, Victoria Ma, an industry leader who speaks four languages, who is a Llamasoft Supply Chain Design Level 1 certified by Coupa Software. She's currently the Digital and Innovation Lead for North America at Meebach Consulting. Victoria, thank you for joining us today as well. Glad to be here. Well, I'm very excited to have both of you on the program today, given your backgrounds. Um, you know, we've got you know, somebody who is the digital innovation uh, expert, and we have a change management practitioner. And as we know, there's a lot of change when it comes to digital transformation. So I'm really excited to get both of your perspectives uh, on this topic. The one thing we love to kick this program off with is kind of a, a the big overarching question. And I, I'd really be interested in, in each of your takes on this, which is, what do you see as the biggest challenge facing the deskless workforce today? You know, Eugene, I, I guess it's okay. I guess I'll kick it off. Yeah, um, please. Eugene, what I see, you know, amongst our clients and, you know, even really amongst uh, my friends and, and, and peers and colleagues, if you will, is, is the retention uh, and motivation these days. Um, you know, a lot of people are still dealing you know, with COVID in their, in their personal lives, uh, in their work lives. Uh, many people are still working from home. You know, myself and Victoria, we are currently kind of in a hybrid model where we work from home some days. Uh, but we, you know, go into the office, but, you know, on a, you know, flip of a switch, you get a news that, uh, you know, someone might have Delta or Omicron and then the whole operation is shut down again. Right. So, you know, a lot of, a, a lot of that back and forth, you know, m just mental health issues in general, I think right now are really facing everyone, uh, regardless of being a deskless worker or not, certainly amongst the deskless workers though. I mean, they're thinking about, they're all usually on the front lines and they're really thinking about their own health uh, and family concerns. And I think motivation right now is, is a big concern. And, you know, everybody's talking about it on TV these days. You know, the great resignation is, is here. Um, you can't flip on an evening news channel or CNBC and not hear about the supply chain struggles uh, that everyone is facing these days. Again, whether it be getting workers in uh, to their shop floors or, or working on new training, new, new, you know, new programs like that. So I, I think for me, that's, that's where in the change management space and on the, in regards to the deskless uh, you know, frontline workers, I think it, I, for me, I think it's the retention and motivation these days. Yeah, obviously that's an issue we've been hearing about a lot, not only this program, but everywhere. Victoria, I know you might, you know, you, you actually look at the world a little bit differently from at least through the lens of digital transformation and technology. I'd love to kind of get your take on, on this as well. Yeah, uh, I can add to that from a kind of digital or technology point of view. What I've seen is uh, first really is the speed of change uh, with technologies nowadays and all those digital tools that, that we have. And we've experienced the frontline worker need to constantly adapt to new tools and new technology. There's always new things to be trained and there's the ramp up period and you finally get used to one thing and then all of a sudden the next round of change is coming whether a new tool or a new version and things that need require the worker to constantly think and adapt and learn. I think that has, this has been a challenge that those are added new elements to their daily work um, in addition. Um, the second piece I also see in, on top of the speed um, of technology is also the comfort level with technology mm. because 
when we get uh, used to it, um, there's always a feeling that we are losing kind of privacy. It's our information online, but also used to be personal information regarding our performance and, and things that not directly visible and measurable now all become like numbers and codes and, and not personal factor in, in those results. And companies are using, using a lot of KPIs to manage all the workloads and all the staff. And the comfort level with exposure to these and being managed using digital tools without um, a strong human factor is another challenge that I've seen through the digital lenses. Yeah, I mean, it certainly seems that you know, from what each of you have kind of spoken about, there's this just increasing stress on the frontline workforce, both from what I would call, quote unquote, real world, the, the real world issues that are out there with with COVID and, and some of those personal pressures, and then kind of the business pressures, it seems that are kind of creeping up on them uh, at work. And it almost seems like it's a, a perfect storm, if you will, or two storms kind of colliding at the same time. I mean, usually people, when you wake up in the mornings, like probably every other, many other humans, at least on this planet, probably, right? You look at your phones. Uh, so you immediately start your day off looking at some sort of digital platform, most likely. I know personally, I wake up, look at Instagram, look at LinkedIn, look at the news and see what's going on out there. And then the same is true when I'm right about to go to bed. I'm usually looking at, again, some sort of technology um, just before I close my eyes. And so to Victoria's point too, there's so much change in technology and it's, it's almost in some ways a technology overload as well. Um, and kind of combining both of our answers together, a lot of that information and a lot of that news that you're hearing about on your te technology device, it's not the greatest of news. It's, it's a bit depressing at times. Um, so again, people really have to, are really taking a second look to see like what's really important to them and, you know, in their lives. Yeah. I think it's a great point, Jason, uh, you know, that I think in general, you're right. There's probably technology overload for everyone. I, I think, you know, when we pick up the phone in the morning or, or in the evening or whatever, a lot of times we're, you know, you know, using the technology we have chosen for ourselves, right? And those applications and those tools we have chosen for ourselves, either for personal life or even a lot of times in our in our business and, and work day, you know, we've kind of chosen tools which we think help us. Victoria, going back to kind of what you talked about a little bit is there's probably more of a perception that the technology that frontline workers are being given isn't they're not choosing it first of all we know that right and it's being kind of pushed down on them and they're saying well i don't even know if this, does this really help me yeah exactly i think for our day-to-day -day technology you're right we're, we're choosing what we want to and then we can switch on and off if we're determined to do so right but for the frontline worker a lot of the new technology also come to their workspace and they're just have have demanded to adapt and to learn and to to use it and that's the the change of process if they don't adapt if they don't do anything with it they won't be able to work in a new environment because this is a new way of working which that reality is creating a lot of stress right because now all of a sudden all the performance is also transparent how come others are adapting in a different speed and not catching up and those are not actually healthy because um, we should, individuals are, are different. There should be different plan by different profile and by different technology. But a lot of the time when corporate or companies are implementing that, it's not to the right level consideration for adaption. It's just one plan and then we're going live this day and then we need to reach this performance by the other day. And there's not enough individual consideration for differences and stress level for adapting the, the, the speed um, in the frontline workers in their workspace. And I think this is a challenge, right? Because we have different culture, we have different age and we have different background, we have different strength, right? And um, I think in adapting technology, those individual differences are not driving the big end consideration when we're designing implementation project or initiative, and that's a source of stress and challenge to, to the individuals who are getting the adaption and doing the actual work. Yeah. I, I mean, there's a ton here I'd really like to dig in on uh, in a little bit. Uh, first, I really would like you know to hear from you guys a little bit more about Meebot Consulting. I'm sure there are folks um, listening in a program that might not be familiar with Meebot. 
Um, and, and I'd love to kind of get um, a perspective on each of your roles. Um, so I don't know who wants to, to, to grab it first. Victoria, please. Okay, so I can give an intro on uh, Mibok Consulting um, for the audience to know us better. Um, so Mibok Consulting is a supply chain consulting firm, uh, which means two things. One is we focus on supply chain. So we're not a generous consulting firm that we, um, general consult consulting firm that we do any type of consulting services. All our um, kind of expert and advices are within the scope of supply chain. However, we do everything within supply chain from sourcing, from designing strategy for manufacturing and distribution to um, engineering design of a distribution center or warehouse or to uh, change management and operational excellence um, for a process within a, a distribution center. All these are our expertise. So we help our client achieve excellence and leverage supply chain as their competitive advantage for their business in the future. Um, the other aspect uh, for us, we are a pure consulting firm. So we don't um, kind of sell our own products, sell our own system or technology, or we're not a logistic service provider to execute supply chain for our clients. We are um, providing consulting service as the, the only kind of product we own. So we uh, stand on, um, we stand because of our people and our service is really, is really our expertise from our team members and global team. And how many consultants, uh, at Miba? Um, I think we're over 400, and okay. um, like specialized supply chain consultants and with other, uh, overhead and other expertise, we are, uh, just below 500 as our global headcount. And since I talk about global, um, just want to mention we're in 24 offices globally, all under the big family of Mibok. Uh, we all collaborating uh, on individual uh, cases or global projects. And basically it's a Mibok company and we have 24 offices instead of 24 individual uh, local Mibok companies. Yep. And you guys are working out of your home offices today. Uh, Jason, I know you are <laughs> in the Indianapolis area. Uh, where in the world are you today, uh, Victoria? I'm in Montreal, Canada. Montreal. Wonderful. Yeah. Hopefully, I know uh, there's some snow coming along, hopefully, for both of you. So, hopefully, you guys stay. I was say, I'll, stay. Be, I'll be joining Victoria in, in Canada here this afternoon, actually, because I'm going to be heading out to a client. So, uh, we, we do travel. We are still <laughs> traveling. And we are, you know, as we, as we get back into the offices ourselves, we are going back and seeing our clients and visiting our clients. So, uh, even though I am in my home office today, you can also find me uh, in our uh, downtown Indianapolis, which is where uh, our North America headquarters is located. Um, and then where Victoria is, is, is our sister office up in Montreal. Great. So Jason, talk about our office today. I mean, our Montreal office today. It's oh. empty because it's not open, but I prefer an office environment. So I'm, I'm here. That's nice. You get some nice quiet time to yourself. So um, exactly. I, yeah, I was, I, I always said I was, you know, I worked from home before the pandemic and then, unlike everyone, I didn't, I, everybody came into my office. That's what wound up happening, you know? <laughs> so um, Jason, tell me a little bit about your role um, as uh, you know, supply chain lead for North America. I mean, yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, for uh, yeah. change management. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess before I even get to that, I guess I'll give a little bit of an evolution of how I even got here. Sure. So, so uh, you know, my background started off, I went, I went to military college. Uh, I went to the Citadel. Um, where I learned basically in a leadership factory, you know, how to become a, a better just leader uh, in, in the business world, in the business community. I uh, started my career then off in, in the Marine Corps in logistics and supply chain for the, for the military. Uh, after I did my you know, active duty service, um, got out and got my graduate degree in aerospace uh, management, my, my master's degree, uh, and actually then worked for Rolls-Royce for several years in manufacturing and uh, production and procurement, uh, material planning, and, and whatnot. Uh, and then after about five years there, uh, decided to really like take on my entrepreneurial spirit and, and get into consulting. Um, and and Mibok uh, was the was the family that I chose out of many uh, out of many suitors, if you will. Uh, and I joined Mibok uh, as a senior consultant, really more focused on supply chain operational excellence and within the four walls of a manufacturing facility or of a warehouse DC. Um, and just through my, through really my many years uh, in industry, 
I've taken my continuous improvement, lean six sigma mindset and, and hat and experience, uh, and then blew it really into what I do today, which is in change management. And part of that evolution as well was me earning my master's degree and learning more about organizational behavior uh, and change management at Purdue University, where I got my where I got my master's from, and really bringing it back here to to Mibach, to really now supporting our clients with change management. As Victoria mentioned, as consultants, even though we don't sell a product, um, we certainly do uh, sell ourselves and sell our services and our expertise. And nobody traditionally hires a consultant just to tell them to stay where they are. You know, <laughs> do do uh, do nothing. Everything you're doing is fine. Absolutely not. As consultants, we are always looking for ways to improve, which is going to require some sort of change, change in ways of working, change in mindset. Um, and so, you know, been with Mibach now, going on to my you know fourth year. Uh, currently, uh, a manager now with, with Mibach um, was was invited to support our global COE on change management, um, and then have now since, you know, been asked to, to lead our global practice on change management, and, and, it's, and certainly in North America as well. Um, and I'm now bringing, bringing our change management expertise and infusing it into all of our projects across, across the entire uh, landscape here, and particularly in, in digital, as we'll, you know, talk more about here today, is, you know, how we support clients in their digital transformations with change management. Um, so that's a little bit about, you know, my journey and uh, how I came to to be at Mivac. Yeah, and I certainly could see, as you mentioned, a lot of overlap in terms of what you do and what uh, Victoria is doing um, because of all the change that and the disruption that's happening from you know digital transformation uh, initiatives. Victoria, t- just a little bit about um, kind of what your practice area kind of focuses on and where you kind of see um, some of the inflection points with your customers. Yeah, so uh, I had a simpler path uh, with my story in, in Mibach. I pretty much uh, joined Mibach since I graduated from college and stay, stayed ever since. Um, now it's my 10th year um, in the industry of supply chain consulting and also my 10th year with Mibach Consulting. Um, however, how I got here is a different path. Um, I focus more on looking at client strategy in supply chain. So really what's their strategy for how many manufacturing nodes or how many plants we need to um, produce for the product, how we plan for our production lines and, and how do we plan for our workforce, how many distribution centers and what assets do we need and what's the wrong range strategy we need to implement five years and 10 years from now. And during my process of providing solution to our client, um, we use a lot of different modeling tools um, to help answer those uh, tricky questions because future, we we can try to predict the future, but whatever we do is going to be wrong, right? It's more about where we can provide a bit more insight than what our client already have now, and also what can be less wrong so that we can set a a strategy that brings supply chain as a competitive advantage. So during the process of leveraging a lot of tools, I found the need for our clients, not just getting advices and solution from ourselves, but also uh, teach them how to fish. So essentially creating digital tools and implementing digital transformation for our clients directly so that they don't just get one strategy and one PowerPoint deck saying this is the consulting firm delivered to us, but also they know what are the drivers to that strategy, what tools they can use to refresh that and what um, digital capability they need to equip for them to reproduce strategy for themselves and for them to implement the strategy that we give them. So after realizing that need, I start to transition myself um, a couple of years back to focus more on digital innovation, really to develop um, tools and leveraging um, data science and algorithms to implement tools for our clients to bring future vision to now and plan for different scenario to set the right strategy for future, really teach them how to fish. And that's essentially what I focus on, on right now. Some example can be um, developing a a model for our client for any product category that they historically have trouble with uh, forecasting, right? There are a lot of um, AI methods now that uh, it may take years for our clients to get adapt to it in their process, but we can help them to develop a more agile and smart tool to focus on the pain points they have. 
It could also be a dynamic capacity planning uh, tool they use to more understand their capacity in their production sites and their distribution set centers more in the real time and short term future so that they can be more agile to respond to supply chain disruptions, which now we know it's more and more often. So this is the area of focus I have right now. And this is where uh, the intersection of change managers also come in play because digital is providing a tool, it's an enabler, but how to use that really depends on how we teach people and with the right concept, the right context, the skill and adoption to the new tools. Yeah, and there's a few, th I would love to come back to that point, uh, Victoria, um, in just a few minutes. First, I wanna go back to kind of that, you know, some of the things you talked about is, you know, what the focus is for Mibach is is really, I, I, I like how you kind of phrased it, Victoria, which is how do they make supply chain a competitive advantage for themselves, right? How, how do these, these organizations do it? But I also go back to Jason, what you kind of characterized as kind of the key challenge early on, right? Which is in that frontline workforce themselves. And, and we've heard, as you just alluded to, Victoria, about all the supply chain uh, challenges and, and disruptions that are happening. So how does that, how, how can a company, right, begin to kind of say, okay, we're going to make supply chain an advantage when they're dealing with some fundamental issues, right, which is like the great resignation and, and you know, workers, you know, and those frontline workers themselves kind of questioning whether this is kind of what they, they want to do with their lives. What's the awareness? I mean, how are you having conversations with your customers when it, when it comes to that, uh, those things? Well, I mean, you know, every time they want to make a change, uh, Eugene, I, I mean, one of the first things we always ask is, is who all is this going to affect? Um, and do they know it's going to affect them, right? Um, you know, it was hard. It was hard before COVID, if you will, where management, yeah. if you will, quote unquote, sat in their offices or in their, you know, ivory towers, for lack of better terminology, right? And didn't come down to the front line and, and see what was actually happening at the front line. But they always had like a grandiose idea that they wanted to implement, you know, some sort of new change. And in this case, maybe a digital change. It's even harder now when in certain companies and industries, people are now even working from home. So they're not even in the building, yeah. uh, much less, you know, you know, on the floor, uh, talking and engaging with those frontline operators and really asking them, what is it that, that you guys and gals on the floor, you know, absolutely need in order to make your lives you know, successful? Um so all the time, Eugene, I mean, the first thing, like I said, we kick off with who is this going to impact? Do they know it's going to impact them? And do they know how it's going to impact them? Um, and so we truly try to sit down and, you know, work through a vision, you know, a vision of where the client really wants to take this new technology and this new improvement towards um, and ask hard questions. You know, is this just something that you, you truly believe in, or is this, you know, what are the driving motive, motives behind why you want to implement this change, if you will, right? And is this the right technology solution that you should implement? Because there could be other alternatives that are out mm. there that that might better fit better fit the uh, the organization as a whole. Um, and the other thing too is, is, have you, again, are you just, you know, thinking this up in a vacuum or have you shared and collaborated this idea with others and then grab their input as to, again, what is the most appropriate technology or tool uh, that, that we should implement, um, you know, again, on the front line. So it's, it's a constant conversation, you know, certainly clients may have their own, um, agendas for sure. Right. And we just as an unbiased party, we just want to make sure in their best interest that we've asked these hard questions, um, and that they're willing to answer these hard questions. And if not answer them, be willing to face then the consequences of having not really thought through, uh, the path forward uh, of their decisions. Are, I mean, the, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, are customers, are your customers aware of the kind of the problem of change management? Just the fact that, hey, we have, maybe we have to kind of take a different approach to this than we have in the past, recognizing um, the complexity of change or, um, or are you kind of going in and saying, no, really trying to educate them on the importance of this? Both, both Eugene. And, and you know, what I really try to explain to clients, because what has happened to today is, you know, change management has become a little bit of a buzzword uh, within the industry. Um, and what, what has really occurred then is people then think change management is this big nebulous thing and they can't put their arms around it. But all we're really talking about at the end of the day, when we're talking about change management, is how do we manage change, right? It's not 
this, it doesn't necessarily have to be rocket science beyond that, but the approach is key. And that's where really having a strong mindset in both organizational behavior and also uh, in emotional intelligence is extremely key to change management. Victoria mentioned, and I kind of want to circle back to it. We all have different change curves that mm -hmm. we go through. Uh, and the speed by which we go through those change curves is different for every individual. And in fact, Eugene, we actually, when we do our offers, we actually talk about change curve management mm. as one of our opening slides to our clients, because it's important that they understand and appreciate that. They may be miles ahead and they may have to slow down a little bit and make sure that the rest of the train, you know, is and the caboose is caught up, you know, to the engine at the front. And so we do sit down with our clients and we do talk about what is change management. And again, what does it mean to you? What does it mean to us from a theoretical standpoint? And then how do we bring the theory and the practical application to, together and merge it? So we do do some workshops on education and training. And then of course we dive into the actual um, execution of, of change management. And it's evolved honestly over the years um, from our days and from our teachings and learnings from, you know, the Toyota production system and, you know, Kaizen and continuous improvement um, to where we are today, where, you know, in school, many, many universities are teaching, again, organizational behavior and change management, which is infused in that. And it's really all about how do you engage with your other stakeholders? And again, make, like I said, making sure you bring them along the line. So Victoria, any, anything I missed there? Any, you know, anything you want to add to that or? No, I think you you captured it well. Um, just to for Eugene's question, also for the trend that we we observe, right? So, um, what I've observed uh, over the past couple of years is clients are more and more aware of the need for adapting different change curve and pay special attention to change management. I do agree with that, Eugene. Um, our clients are becoming more aware of change management. Um, I think it's because. We're talk we are talking about it more on business channels. We are talking and seeing it more in articles. Um, COVID was a very big change that happened to the entire globe all at once. It's not common, you know, that the entire globe experiences change all at, all at once, you know, outside of maybe the dinosaurs being wiped off the face of the planet. So mental health, change management, uh, depression, all of these things really started coming to the forefront, right? Um, you know, old school ways of thinking as well as how do you engage with employees? How do you motivate employees has completely changed. And in the past, again, you know, managers and leaders wanted to see their people, you know, at their desk or at their machines or on their forklifts. And in many cases, you know, especially in the operations world, you still got to have people on your forklifts and you still got to have people, you know, on their machines, but necessarily coming into the office and being able to do just what we're doing right here right now, virtual collaboration, has extremely changed the game. Um, some have stuck with it, you know, as we move out of this pandemic um, and are allowing and, and embracing, you know, the hybrid work, work workforce. Some are not, uh, which are saying, you know, you have to come back into work or we want you to be 100% remote. These, these three things, 100% in the office, remote or, or some sort of hybrid in between, these three things are now becoming differentiators and factors, again, it goes to, do I want to stay at this current company or maybe do I want to test my waters and go do something else in my life? Maybe even getting out of the business world as a whole. Um, maybe I don't want to, again, learn a new technology. You know, I've, I've put my kids through college. You know, it's, it's time for me to move on. Or, you know, my parents made me go to college and learn this new skill set. But now that I'm actually on the front line doing it, maybe I want to use my degree in a different way. Or maybe I don't want to use my degree at all. Uh, and I want to go off and start my own company and something completely and wildly different than, you know, what I even went to school for. Yeah. So, uh, uh yeah, I, I think it's really interesting. I mean, you know, uh, and, and I'd love to come back to this notion of, of change curves that you both mentioned, right. Cause I, I, yeah. uh, you know, and you've talked about this. I mean, you have these very different, you know, you know, a, a, a very, you know, varied kind of workforce at this point, both in terms of their, uh, emotional engagement, um, their motivations, certainly their um, demographics, cultural mm -hmm. backgrounds, technographics, you know, so what are some of the techniques that you help your customers use, right, to kind of address the multiple different change curves within a frontline organization? 
Yeah, so I could at least start off and say we don't do any sort of Vulcan mind tricks or yeah. uh, anything <laughs> like that, right? Um, you know, change curves, change curve management, if you will, and change curves have been around for years and for decades. And I want to make sure I give credit where credit is due. Um, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross was one of the first um, uh, really like practitioners and subject matter experts to talk about change curves. Now, she talked about it in the five stages of grief uh, mm -hmm. and how someone goes through those stages when, you know, they've lost somebody you know, in their life. Um, then others have come along, such as Williams Bridges, who then actually talked about change curve management and how you go from uh, basically an ending phase to a neutral phase to then a new beginnings phase, right? What we do, Eugene, is we, we educate our clients on, on that history, on that, you know, theories and on those academics, if you will, at first, if you will, because it's, it's important that they have a ground base of where we're starting from when we approach them before we then get into practical application. They got to know the theory and, and, if you will, the science behind it and the years of industry practice behind it before we, you know, really then delve into the execution of it. Same with also emotional intelligence. Um, it's very important that we as consultants, we come with high emotional intelligence. COVID again made that a little bit difficult because again, a lot of people may not want to be on camera when we're in meetings. You know, it's, it was a way easier but in the past when we were in the same conference room or in the same, you know, workshop, being able to sit across from somebody, being able to see their body reaction, um, the tone of their voice, um, how, are, you know, maybe they might be saying something out loud, but their body language is completely different than, than, what, uh, than what they're saying, if you will, right? So, that emotional intelligence, if you will, has become even more important now because now you really got to even be able to read through the tea leaves even more so through a text message, through an email, through a Teams chat or whatever it may be. Um, you know, it's, it's even more vitally important that we are aware of those different, again, those different theories, those, those different concepts, if you will. Are there tools, though, that help? Um, oh yes, yes. In, yes. in terms of in terms of kind of facilitating that for the individuals, I mean, what are some of those techniques that can Absolutely. actually be applied? As you said, it's not it's not brains, it's not you know rocket science, it's, it's you know. But at the same point, there's some complexity here that that does need to be solved. I'm a little, I am a little old school in this way of thinking. I do always like to start off with a good strong stakeholder analysis, yeah. uh, where I really sit down and I go over whether it be high, high level at, at, at the cross-functional standpoint or down to the actual individuals themselves, I want to understand what are the type of individuals that we're working with. So I will do, and I do take my clients through a private, because it's important you keep it private because you're going to have, in order to really get underneath the hood and understand how someone is, is working and operating, you're going to have to have some private and privacy uh, about the conversation. So doing a documented stakeholder analysis um, is really one of the first things that, that we like to start off with at Mibok, really delving into what makes Johnny and Jane, you know, tick. What are, what are some of the things that are motivating them in life? What are some of the things that are not motiv motivating them in life? How do you think their attitude towards this project is going to be? You know, again, I, I try to always tell executives, power and influence doesn't come with a title. The most powerful and influential person, especially when you're talking about deskless operators on the shop floor or on the warehouse floor, could be that person who sits on the forklift, uh, or it could be that person who's running the CNC machine, you know, and their title, if you will, is just operator or MHE operator. It's not the COO or the vice president of, you know, supply chain. Um, the most influential person could be the person who, who could really rally the troops and turn this opportunity, turn this change on its head, if you will. And so doing that stakeholder analysis and knowing who that individual is, and then understanding how do we bring that person along on this journey to the best of our ability is important. Not everybody's going to buy into the change. Um, and so if that person is, is not going to buy into the change, other hard conversations within the organization are going to have to be had, um, which doesn't necessarily mean some sort of disciplinary action by any means. But you are going to have to address that elephant in the room at some point. Having a stakeholder analysis as your starting point helps you put that game plan and project plan in place to how you're going to approach and communicate in some sort of communication plan, how you're going to communicate with that stakeholder or stakeholders um, in this instance and case. You know, one of the things that, you know, um, this communication stakeholder analysis, uh, you know, is great points and the communication aspect, especially what's different about communicating to the frontline workforce or what are some of the, the unique challenges to communicating to a frontline workforce, I should say. Don't let the messenger mix up the message or get the message um, diluted, 
right? Many times, it's not the message that sets people off, it's the messenger, mm. if you will. And so you need to, again, doing that stakeholder analysis and coming up and developing that communication plan, maybe it shouldn't be an executive who's, who's briefing the frontline operators uh, on a change, on a digital change that's, that's pending. Maybe you actually, what I would actually encourage people to do is you bring somebody who is influential amongst that stakeholder group, you make them part of the steering committee, you make them part of the guiding coalition. And, and then that individual, if they have the respect and clout of their peers at, at the front line, allow them to be the ones who are going to then communicate this message to their fellow peers. Um, two things will happen when you do that. One, again, the message won't get diluted, but two, they will feel a lot more appreciative that one of their own mm. was in the room representing them. And it wasn't just, you know, a bunch of, again, if you will, white collar individuals who are making all the decisions, but maybe it was a little bit more of a collaborative, you know, environment, a collaborative project effort, if you will, that did include voices from the shop floor. You, you might've heard the term in the past, voice of the customer. Yeah. Other, there are a couple other voices that are important, voice of the process, right? What is the process telling me? And, and are we adhering to it and listening to what it's trying to tell us? And then voice of our internal customers or our, our internal stakeholders, right? Get, get, get the voice of the people in the room with you as well. So again, you know, you're not making, you may not agree with everything they have to say, but at least you're gonna be making more informed decisions, if you will. And you also can't claim to be blindsided if you didn't know that this may be the sentiment of how the people on the, uh, you know, in the warehouse floor, on the manufacturing floor, or, or in the digital space as well, uh, are feeling about it, a certain initiative. Yeah. So, you know, I know, um, you know, Victoria brought this up earlier, which is, I think the underlying kind of theme about this was the anxiety that, you know, perhaps a lot of, you know, frontline workers are feeling when faced with, you know, technology, that anxiety of like, okay, I've got big brother watching me, that anxiety about like, they're going to see my performance down to the nth degree. And if I don't perform well, then my job is at stake. Um, I guess a couple of questions related to that from a change management perspective is, you know, how do you, um, I mean, how do you, I guess one of the ways to quell those anxieties, as you said, is have, you know, that respected member of the team kind of in the room, right. Mm -hmm. You know, um, mm -hmm. whether it's your, it's a well, well-known colleague or even a, a line manager or supervisor who's well-respected, you know, having Absolutely. them part of that. Um, I guess the other question is on the flip side, are organizations, at least leadership within organizations starting to recognize the anxiety that is occurring and maybe taking a different approach, even in terms of the, the type of solutions they're trying to roll out? I would say yes. Uh, but I don't want to say it's, you know, it's everybody's different and every organization is different. Yeah. So it's not necessarily just car blanche, but certainly we are seeing, again, clients recognizing that change management is important and that they may not have the internal resources to actually lead on that change yeah. management. Um, excuse me. So, um, you know, what we're seeing in, in a lot of our offers and a lot of our requests for proposals that are coming across to us is great. Tell us about your, your digital approach. Tell us about your consulting approach, but then also specifically talk to us about how you deal with change management is what we're also seeing as well um, it, coming coming across. So companies are recognizing that change management is important. Um, Eugene, I want to go back though to what you said though, or what you were kind of asking and, and kind of what I was also saying before that. The messaging is so important. There is going to be a big brother aspect to digital technology because there's yeah. going to be now more tracking and tracing and analytics that are going to go into it. It's so vitally important that if you really want people to buy into, you know, the sense of urgency, then that the sense of urgency is truthful and transparent. If you're using this information to look at productivity enhancements or look at automation, own that. Um, just own that. People can see it. Yeah. You know, they can see you right through you when, when you're not, especially if you are a leader in the organization that is not well respected, that may not be trusted. You know, if you even are trying to be honest and transparent, but you might have a bad reputation that, that comes with it, that change initiative could, could fail from the jump. So it's very important that the face of the change, the messengers of the change, they're all individuals, again, who've got the respect and clout, who can deliver, you know, those key aspects of the project to, to the wider masses. Um, 
and again, be transparent, be honest about what are you going to use this information for? Because, you know, you hear every, all, all, all the time, you know, and Congress is always having people come up and test, testify on how much our social media is tracking us, how much information is our bank accounts giving out to, to third parties, you know, hackers that might be out there as well, right? Who can also hack into our organization's digital tools. Um, you need to be, you just gotta, you gotta be transparent. You gotta really own what is the vision and purpose of why we want to go through this change. Yeah. It's like the cover up is worse than the crime kind of thing, right? Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, you know, you, you also made this allusion to, you know, a lot of companies, you know, probably don't have that change management expertise or capability internally, right. To kind of manage mm -hmm. through some of this change, where have you seen, where does that, you know, if they don't have like an awesome office of, of organizational change management, formal office, where has that kind of fallen to in organizations as you've seen, or is it just fall through the cracks? Well, again, not every company is the same. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it might fall on the continuous improvements and six Sigma uh, folks in the, in the organization. Those who are always usually doing some sort of continuous improvement projects, your master black belts and, and black belts, if you will, uh, they naturally, you know, fall into being change agents or change managers. Sometimes it's just Johnny, you're up and you got to be the face of this and you got to lead this change. Um, don't care how you do it, but you're also going to be responsible for it. Right. Um, there is not a cookie cutter approach to it. Um, if you have organizational leaders who appreciate change management, they will do a little bit more science and backing into of, okay, who do we pick to kind of help us be the change agent and change manager. And again, who then is the, who's the appropriate project manager, who's the appropriate sponsor of this effort as well. Cause that all goes into, into the change management, uh, the project, you know, traditional project ma management elements, project management, project manager, excuse me, steering committee members, sponsors that goes into also leading in the change successfully. Uh, but it, you know, it, it comes from anywhere and, and a change agent and a change management should be able to come from anywhere. It's again, it's not, it's not only one cross-functional group that can lead a change. Um, you got to have people really who buy into the vision and buy into the mission. That's where your change agents are really going to come from. Um, which again, it could be that shop floor operator or that's that supervisor on the line. Um, or it could be, you know, a manager that's sitting in procurement. It, it can, that person could come from anywhere. Um, it doesn't have to come from just the quote unquote change management office. Yeah. In yeah. fact, in fact, it's better yet, Eugene, that they don't come from a quote unquote change yeah. management office because at the end of the day, that person's probably going to then leave and move on to another project. You want your change agent to be somebody who's actually going to be living and breathing and helping to sustain this, you know, in the future. Yeah. See it all the way through. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so I, you want to talk a little bit about kind of, you know, all right the seeing it through part a little bit more, right? Because you've talked an awful lot about communication. You've talked about that, you know, the buy-in, you know, you know, from the, the, the frontline workers and that, you know, transparency and, and truthfulness. There's also, right, the phase where, okay, we have to get these people ready, right? You know, so even if they've bought in, we have to prepare them adequately to be able to, you know, if we're changing their if we're changing the way we're doing things from a, an operational standpoint, if we're changing their technology, talk a little bit about some of the implementation approaches like training and, and, and some of those things. Absolutely. So the speed by which we, by which people go through their change curve, as Victoria was mentioning earlier is, is vitally important. And sometimes companies don't appreciate, we might need to slow this train down. Uh, and if we did have a hard deadline, then we maybe should have started this train a little bit earlier if possible. Mm -hmm. Because you cannot force down someone's throat how quickly they are going to adapt uh, and, and realize the appreciation of the change that needs to occur. Um, you, you just can't. Every individual is different. We're not robots, right? And what might be able to come faster for some may not be able to come as quickly as for others. Um, so Eugene, what we do a lot of, you know, a lot of, in a lot of cases, we do a, try to do a lot of hands-on training. We try to do a lot of just, again, education, not only just the change that's coming and change management, but then also practical application, allowing individuals to smell and breathe and test in the digital space, really test out, you know, some of the changes that are forthcoming and giving them time to breathe, go come in, come in for the training, come in for an understanding and then go away, sit on that, muddle on that for a little bit, think about it, come back in, let's have a discussion. You know, what did you pick up from this? What did you, you know, what did you take away from the last time we spoke? All that. Again, the mind can only consume 
with so much in one given moment, yeah. you know, reputation, re repetition, excuse me, uh, is as many times required in order for something to sink in. I got to hear it and see it 10 to 20 times before it actually sinks in, you know, and becomes, you know, a muscle memory or repetitive to me. So yeah. what we do with our clients is again, we build that time, build that time into our project plans. And we say, look, realistically, and it's not going to be the same each and every time, but realistically, we got to build in some sort of time frame, a, an acceptable time frame for people to get that understanding and appreciation. Um, and where people are having difficulties, let's make time to set, you know, set aside time rather to, to again, work on retraining, work on incentive, incentivizing, you know, how we can get people to maybe learn faster. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, and I love how you brought up that point about, you know, we always uh, you talk a lot about one and done kind of training is like, okay, here's what's happening. You will learn it. And now you go do it. Um, and we know, you know, we know that's not effective. Um, you know, psychology and as has taught us, it's not effective, but it also, that also spikes the anxiety, which is like, okay, yeah. you know, now it's like, now I've got to go do this or else, you know, my job is on the line. So I, and, I, yeah, and we all learn differently, Eugene. Yes. Uh, you know, some people learn well reading a book and, and, or, and other people sometimes have to be hands-on. Um, some people prefer neither one of them. They just want to be told what to do, right? They're maybe more auditory. And so they don't want to have to be stuck in a classroom, you know, having to learn these things. So you got to understand what, how, cause you, you can't have a training necessarily for each individual. You got to have a, a, an appropriate training approach for the masses, if you will, you know, but but having that recognition and, and you know, recognizing that, okay, we're gonna, we might have to train a little bit differently. We might have to, again, have some practical application or like a test environment where people can make mistakes without you know, causing an error or, or a customer down the line is gonna get something you know, incorrect or erroneous. Building in that model office is, is extremely important. Yeah, and, and having a, a variety of, of different approaches, you know, perhaps that, addresses those different kind of learning needs, right? That you kind of talked about. Absolutely. Um, it's funny because we've even heard, you know, that you mentioned kind of classroom training. You know, some people, there's some people I, I, you know, we've talked to have said, yeah, I mean, I can't stand it. I don't want to raise my hand in a, in a classroom. I just don't like doing that. So they go take the training. They know there's things they don't know, but they're too embarrassed to kind of ask. And mm -hmm. then there are other people who tend to dominate those discussions as well, right? And, and take most of the time maybe to wrap this piece up a little bit is okay. Sure. So how do you, how do you measure it? How do you measure if change has been effective? How do you measure? It's like, okay, uh, we, we've got, we've gotten over the, at least over the initial finish line. Good question. So first, first and foremost, one of the easiest ways is taking your current state KPIs and seeing if there has been an improvement or, or some sort of quote unquote change for the better or for the worse. If they have gotten worse, then we need to address that gap and understand why they got worse and get them to improve. Another way that we do from a little bit more of the softer side, if you will, of, of how we can measure change is we do things like surveys, uh, sentimental, sentimental surveys, right? Like, are you aware of a forthcoming change or, you know, how do you currently engage with the current system? If there is one that we're re replacing um, and then do before and after surveys, right? And understanding, again, has there been a change and especially a change for the better? If there has been a change for the worse, don't ignore it, address it. and it, and understand why there's been a change for the worst and again, work on improving it. So there's, there's hard, hard technical ways, KPIs, there's soft ways like surveys. Um, there's even softer ways where it's maybe one-on-one -on -one interviews, feedback sessions, uh, whether again, be one-on-one -on -one or, in, or, you know, in group feedback sessions, if you will, multiple different ways that you can, that you can address that. Yeah, absolutely. I think measurement is such an important factor. I'm glad you were able to kind of talk about that a little bit. Um, any closing thoughts, Jason? I you know this has been such a fantastic, you know, uh, you know, you talk about people who are passionate about what they do. It's certainly, I can see your passion coming through. Um, and I've really appreciated discussion. Any kind of closing thoughts for the audience today? You know, I guess, Eugene, just, I, I guess I, what I want folks to walk away from, especially senior executives, if you will, we'll, we'll start off with senior executives is one, appreciate, appreciate emotional intelligence, appreciate human intelligence. Um, and really the, the new science that's out there of organizational behavior and, and understanding if you want to build a strong culture, you're going to have to get underneath the hood a little bit. It, it's kind of like in some ways how parents have to, you know, appreciate their, their kids, right? Their mental health and what, what are they going through? And, 
you know, oh, you can't be so soft. Well, in this new age, we got to be a little bit softer and understand what's, what's going on in, in people's mindsets and, and, and underneath the hood, if you will. For our frontline, you know, brothers and sisters, what I would ask of them is just be open-minded. Um, appreciate that change is hard. We all go, through, again, through change curves differently. Um, and for really both parties to come together and work together. Change is not going to happen if only one stakeholder group is, is pushing it. It's going to require an extremely cross-functional, collaborative, uh, and mixed diverse team in order to make changes successful. So that's what I would ask folks. And if you don't know where to start um, and or you don't want to have to bring on that resource internally all the time, consider consider you know Mibot Consulting um, and, and others, but certainly consider Mibot Consulting um, and our approach, if you will, of how we deal with change management, especially when it comes to um, in the supply chain space. Um, also consider the additional education and additional trainings, workshops, things like that. Um, and getting people, you know, try to get people back together, at least, you know, collaborating with, with each other. So that is one thing I would want your viewers to, to walk away with. Great. Um, that, and, and I think yeah, just a, keep an open mind and open spirit. And I think that's a great transition, Jason, to where folks can find you LinkedIn. If they want to yes. Jason Jackson yes. uh, at LinkedIn, uh, at Mibach Consulting, uh, can't forget about Victoria as well, even though she had a, unfortunately had a, 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 a fire drill that uh, took her out midway, but uh, we appreciated her insights. You can find her at Victoria Ma. Um, and I'm sure uh, folks can find more information about Mibach Consulting at the website, um, www.mibach.com. Jason, really want to thank you for joining it, today. I've really enjoyed the discussion. Oh, something else. Go ahead. Yeah, I just, want, I just wanted to call out to you as well where people can find us because as long as we don't get shut down for, for COVID, we're going to be at a couple of conferences this year, Eugene, oh, and I just wanted to just call out yeah, some of the please conferences do. that we're going to be at. Please do. Um, yeah, so the first one that we're planning on being at, uh, either myself or members of our team uh, here in North America is going to be at the RELA link, which is the Retail Industry Leaders Association Supply Chain Conference. It's going to be in Dallas, Texas this year, and it's, and it's February 21st to the 24th. In March, we'll be in Atlanta for a Modex, uh, and that's the material handling focus uh, event where we really focus a lot on uh, industrial engineering and operational excellence and change management. So uh, folks can, can check us out there in, in Atlanta in, in March. In April, we're going to be at Inspire, which is hosted by Coupa. Uh, that's going to be in Las Vegas, and that's going to be the 4th to the 7th. That has a huge and strong focus on, on digital. Uh, and we're gonna have a couple of different sp client speaking sessions um, at that same time too. And I'm pretty sure that, that uh, Victoria will be there. And then at least taking us through the summer, uh, where we will also be at the Gartner Supply Chain Symposium um, in Orlando, Florida, June 6th and 9th, which is gonna have a strong focus on uh, the executives uh, and some of our partnerships that we've got going on in the digital space. So I just wanted to quickly call that out. Some of the places that we're gonna be at that you can come and see us uh, if you're in the area. That's great, Jason. I'm, I'm glad you did that. And I'm glad that people are starting to get back out there and going to events and meeting each other in person again. It's been a while since I've asked that question. And I was remiss in not answering, asking it because every time I have in the past, nobody's going anywhere. But it, I'm glad to see you guys are. And again, thanks for uh, taking the time to join us today. Safe travels this week. Um, Thanks so much. Hopefully without any, um, any interruptions. Thanks, Eugene. Um, Thanks for having me. Thank you, Jason. Uh, so let's wrap it up here, folks. I hope sure. you found this conversation as enjoyable as I have. If so, please share and rate the podcast. Five-star ratings help ensure that it gets promoted to other professionals like you that are innovating on the front lines. And just a reminder, this podcast is sponsored by Skillful, the mobile digital adoption platform for deskless and frontline workers. You can visit the Skillful website at skyllful.com. And if you or someone you know is out there innovating on the front lines, we'd love to hear about it. Please reach out to me on LinkedIn and share your story. Until then, see you on our next episode.